everybody hear me? Cool. All right. Uh, so the name of this talk is Using Elixir Script. And what I hope to do with this talk is get people to, to, uh, to either try the Elixir Script or, or get involved with the project and, uh, and help out and get it closer to the finish line. Um, if, my name is Brian Joseph. I work at Ruffery, uh which is a consultancy comp company in New Orleans and where I get to do some Elixir um, projects. Um, I am from New Orleans and I st I'm still there. And you can find me on GitHub, Twitter, and Hex. Um, same username, Brian JOS. So what is Elixir script? It is an Elixir JavaScript compiler. Has anybody ever tried it yet? Uh, or looked at it? Oh, that's one, a couple more. Uh, well, cool. So the project was started late January 2015. It has about, about 800 stars, a little bit less. Um, had 11 contributors, um, but most of it's been, most of it's been me. Uh, and my proudest uh, stat is that it's written mostly in Elixir, and I hope to make that to like 100% one day. That would be nice. Um, the project goals are to use Elixir in JavaScript environments. So I hear um, people say that JavaScript can run, is the only language that runs everywhere. I kind of disagree with that. But even so, I would prefer to write Elixir and, uh, and use Elixir in those environments. So um, in Node, and in particular the browser, um, using Elixir in, in, that, in those situations. And also easy interoperability with JavaScript. Um, Want to make it easy to use JavaScript modules um, and use JavaScript functions and use the, 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 the uh, JavaScript data types, um, primitives, without any kind of ceremony. And for the most part, that's still true. So there's been a couple of, there, there are a couple of projects that were created strictly to facilitate um, Elixir script. One of those is the, the ES3 project. So ES3 is actually a, a JavaScript spec. It was based off the, the SpiderMonkey EST, and it is the one that most of the JavaScript tools around the JavaScript EST are based off of. So for instance, um, Esprima adheres to it. Um, Babel, I think it has like a kind of a derivative of it, but it kind of uses it. Um, so that's up to date as of ES 2017. So the latest changes in ES 2017 were async and await, so you can use that. And what this ES3 module does um, in Elixir script, I'm sorry, in Elixir, um, it defines a JavaScript, it, was, it, was a, it was a, excuse me, it defines structs for each of the JavaScript AST nodes and also defines tools for you to build up a JavaScript AST and also um, take that AST and turn it into JavaScript code. There are also three node pro uh, JavaScript pro uh, modules that were created for Alexa script. The first one is tailored, which is the pattern matching library. The next one is the Erlang types library, which has Erlang primitives. So Alexa script will use the JavaScript equivalents when it can. But for things like references and PIDs and tuples and bit strings, this library creates JavaScript implementations for those. And the second, I mean, the third one is processes, which is the, the Erlang process model. This one is the one that isn't really used in Elixir script just yet. It's, it works for as far as I can, as far as I can tell in JavaScript, um, but it's kind of hard to shoehorn it into what's already there, so that's kind of been the issue. So, how does it work? So it takes in Elixir files, like Elixir code files or code, or code strings as input. It passes those to the Elixir compiler, and what this does is whenever you have a, a, um, an error in, your, in the code you pass in, you get Elixir's nice error messages, so the same error messages you, you are familiar with. The second um, value you get from that is that it loads in the modules that it compiled, 
so that we can use those to expand macros whenever we get to them. It then converts those code strings um, basically to the Elixir AST, and it does some pre-processing like um, one of those is turning the variables into like, um, you know when you do like A equals one, A equals two, and it turns into like different variables in, um, in the background with, with Elixir. It kind of does things like that. Um, and then it goes and transforms the Elixir AST to JavaScript AST. And then from there it turns JavaScript, the JavaScript AST to JavaScript code. So this kind of, uh, an image of how things work. You got input, your Elixir code files, and output JavaScript code files. And in the middle is a pipeline of different, um, different steps that it takes. And in code, it's almost like a literal pipeline where each of these steps handles a different case in the compilation process. And I got the idea from um, a friend of mine who showed me a video by um, Andy Keep. I think it was a closure, uh, a closure conference, and he was showing off uh, NanoPass compilers. And this isn't, each of these aren't like necessarily a nano, like a NanoPass compiler, but it gave me the idea to break up the steps of the compilation into these, um, into these passes. Um, and it made it easier to maintain and easier to, to remove things or move things around if I needed to, um, so. It, it slows on the compilation process, but I think it's still worth it. So here is a mapping of what, um, how Elixir script handles the primitives. So a list turns into a JavaScript array, a map turns into an object, an atom turns into a symbol, a binary into a string, and an integer and a float into a number. And for our bit string, um, tuple, PIDs, and references. That's where the Erlang types um, library comes in, and it has implementations for, for those. So what can I do so far? So most of the special forms, uh, modules, functions, pattern matching, public macros, protocols, structs, sigils, bit strings. Um, I'm probably missing some things in this list. I, I kind of went through the, Elix, the, um, the Elixir Lang uh, guide and just started writing things down just to get like a proper list. <laughs> For the standard library, it can do, um, well you see in the complete column, there's a lot of things that, that are complete. Agent, uh, well I'll get to that later. Um, so those are the things that are, are complete um, as far as like it has all the functions and macros there. Um, incomplete. Um, kernel, it doesn't implement everything just yet. In enum, it doesn't implement everything. And it is also the only thing that is, ex all of these are actually implemented within the Elixir script, so we're actually in Elixir. Enum is the only one that isn't um, for a couple of reasons. Um, I won't go into it right now. <laughs> so limitations, um, no OTP, so don't even try. Um, buggy processes, so I'm going into this a little bit, the, this, these uh, no OTP in, in the buggy processes. So I showed you all the Erlang processes um, JavaScript packet um, module that um, I created, and that works just fine. The problem has just, has always been um, integrating that within the compilation process that I have right now. Um, and so I've been, I've tried a couple of times to, to add it into, into, the, um, into Elixir script. Um, but every now and then, well, when I try, I would come across a different issue. Like before, the first time I was like, I have to go back and all the JavaScript code that I wrote for this, I have to go back and turn it into generators. Um, because the pro for processes library works off of generators. Everything has to be a generator for it to work. Um, so I stopped at that point, and then I came back like months later, and I was like, I'm really gonna do this now. This is gonna happen. <laughs> and I got pretty far, but then I realized how important OTP is when I was like, how do I start all this? <laughs> oh, that's right, there's an application start thing, and I don't have that yet. And then it, it just like kept piling on, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna stop now. <laughs> so that's kind of the story around that. 
Um, not all special forms are implemented. So super is actually the only one that isn't implemented at all. Um, quote, I think location is the only option that isn't supported, but everything else is there. No private macros. Because of the way that um, I showed earlier of how we're getting the, the modules and using that to load um, the macros, there's not really a way to do that with private macros as far as I can tell. Um, so it's, it doesn't support private macros just yet. An incomplete standard library, which I showed before, uh, doesn't recognize dependencies. So it actually was going to, um, but I wanted to ask some, um, some, for some feedback on how I did things, which is basically going into the depths folder and getting everything and, and compiling that. Um, when, I, when, when I asked, um, someone said that that's probably not the best way to do things. And then I asked, like, how else should I do it? And I didn't get an answer. So I just backed it out because I trusted that they probably knew they were talking about. So still looking for a solution for that. And also, you still need Babel or some kind of tool to convert um, the output to something that, that is usable. And the main reason is ES modules. So back when I started this, was it January 30th, 2015, um, either the, the ES 2015 spec was completed or was about to be. Anyway, 2015 had ES modules in it, and so I was like, we're just gonna um, you know, go, in that route, go in that direction. Fast forward to, what is this, uh, February 2017, and we still can't use ES modules natively within browsers or within Node. And it's, big, it's around the ES loader um, spec, which if you start thinking about like how to load in ES modules, it, it's, it's not an easy thing. So that's why. And I've, I think if I would have went back, if I had to go back, I would probably use uh, common JS modules instead. And I even have code in Elixir script to, to use ES, um, common JS, but I haven't pulled the trigger because it always seems like ES modules are so, cl so close to being this, just a thing but they aren't yet. So installation, so how would you install it? The first way would be using, uh, if you wanna use the CLI, you can either compile it and install it from source. You can, for each release, there's a pre-compiled pre version which you can use. Or if you're on Mac OS, you can use brew install Elixir script. Um, and somebody's been really helpful in keeping um, the homebrew version up to date. Um, I don't know who it is, but I, I thank you. And I think there's actually one for, uh, for Arch Linux, I think. What is it, the AUR? That's what it's called. Um, I think there's a way you can get it from there. Um, and one of the things I also did was I created a, a boilerplate project, which I don't even like boilerplate projects, but I just made it easier for, for people to use Elixir script with a, within the front end project. And the only thing it really requires is that you have the, the Elixir script CLI installed. Um, so if you wanna get up and running pretty quickly, you can do that. The second way is um, as a mixed dependency. So you can add it to your, your list of uh, mixed dependencies. You can get, what you get with that is a mixed task which acts just like the CLI. But the really cool thing you get with that is that you can add it to your list of mixed compilers um, and add some options in there for figuring out where the input and output is. And whenever you do mixed compile, it'll actually go through um, use to the input and output folders and compile the code. So you only have to um, use mixed compile to actually make that happen. So how do you interact with JavaScript? The first one we're gonna show is you, uh, using the JS module. So the JS module contains um, functions and macros that are, um, that map to JavaScript keywords or just helper functions that while I've been uh, testing, I've kind of had, a, um, had a, have a need for. So the two I've used the most, and you'll probably use the most, are import um, and new. Um, which is also type of, instance of, uh, global, throw, um, yield, and def gen and def gen p are how you would create generators. Um, and to use these, I mean, since it is a, an Elixir module, you would use either require JS or import JS, but you can't import import, so just keep that in mind. So 
the first one we'll talk about is importing an um, ES module. So you would use js.import, um, and it takes, the first argument is the name of the module that you want to, like the, what you want to call the module within your Elixir code. So the example here is with React, um, and we, we want to call it React. And then the second is the path to it, which in this case is just, it's, it's just React. And you can see at the top of that what kind of um, import statement it creates in JavaScript. So these are, the default is to make a default import. But if you wanted to use a, a non-default import, you can add the, the default specifier, the, um, the default option, and, add, and make it false. And then you would get a, an import star as um, import. The second one, the second one that you probably use the most because JavaScript is is uh, this JavaScript, is uh, creating a new object. So with that, um, js.new will create a new object. You give it the name of the object and then a list of arguments. Um, one note is Elixir script can't create classes, but you can instantiate them. So there's no like def class or anything like that. And there probably won't be because I don't like classes. But um, you can still create them when you need to. So how would you call web, web APIs within your code? The, the Erlang module syntax, basically. So if you want to call document.getElementById, it's just colon document.getElementById. Um, same thing with console and window. Um, window, as you know, is like in browsers, is the global thing. So you could just call alert, but you can't do that in, in, Elixir, in Elixir script. Um, because it's, that alert wouldn't be defined within your, um, within the scope. Um, anyway, what I'm getting at is, if you find yourself in a situation where you don't have window, or you just don't know what the global, what the global ob um, object is called, you can, do, you can do JS, you can use js.global instead. So for instance, in a browser it's window, in a web worker, the global is self, I think. And in Node, I think, I think it's called global. So, and there's, I don't know, I don't know what's, uh, what the state of it is, but there is actually a, um, a spec for JavaScript to create an actual global function so that you can make it, um, you can have more agnostic code. Um, but, so below that, I have examples of calling, uh, of creating a new date, which is, that date is actually a, a JavaScript date. And then you can see you can do date.now, which you can use that syntax there because date is uppercase and you, you can just call it. And I didn't realize this got pushed off. But I had an example down here, let's see. Oh yeah, we can't do that. Uh, of calling fetch, so using the fetch API. And you can see we're you're using uh, that then on it and we have the anonymous functions which are you are using to handle um, whatever, what's returned. So some rules. So what you can do is use the Erlang module syntax to call functions. What you can't do is call functions that start with uppercase because um, you can't do that in Elixir. And you can't call functions that are not, you know, not in the scope, so you can't just call alert. And it's not, gonna, it's not gonna know what to do. So code sharing. You actually can share some code between Elixir and Elixir script as long as they support um, the same APIs, so obviously Elixir script was going to be the least common denominator with that. Uh, once again, you can't use dependencies yet in Elixir script, so you couldn't you couldn't use dependencies with that. Uh, the bonus is that you can actually share code between Elixir and JavaScript, which I've done before, where I had uh, implemented uh, was it the Base64 VL, VLQ um, module in Elixir, and I was able to like use that with an Elixir, and also I was able to call it from Node in, um, in JavaScript. Um, so now I can show some examples. Let's see. The first one I'm gonna show is using it with web APIs. And I'll just actually start this.
Is that, is that easy to see, or should I zoom it up some more? OK. Um, so this is actually a project which is based off the Elixir script uh, boilerplate that I showed before. And I'm just going to go through the lines to, to, um, to show off something. So we have our module here called App. Um, we're requiring JS because we want to use, uh, down here we're using JS for JS.new. One thing I didn't talk about is um, I, I, the Elixir script compiler will look for like a couple of module app attributes for a certain thing. So one of those is on JS load. And what that will do is when it, when it compiles this function, it'll actually call that main first. So you can't really do something like this as far as I know on Elixir. But this is what it actually will do with, um, within the compiled ES module. Um, and you see here I have a private function that's called log, and I am matching on the ID of that. For, so uh, one of them is called my div, one of them is my span. And they kind of do the same things, but it's just an example of using uh, pattern matching. And before I was piping things to the Elixir compiler, you actually could use like the actual name, like HTML, div, element, but you can't do that anymore. So don't try. I have been thinking about maybe making something that will like list out the, the web APIs and just like build out modules for them, um, like a macro, but um, I haven't done that. And below we have our main, which we're getting the, um, the elements, so my div and my span. It's creating a list, and then it's taking that list and piping it through, um, through map and it's calling log on both of those. And then for each of these, it's going through and, and creating a, a, um, a click um, handler. And then finally, all it's doing here is creating a date and then displaying it. And so now we will go, where is it? Long line. There we go. So it's just, come on, there we go. There's nothing really much to it, so it's it's showing the console output that um, is here and also here. And if I click here, you can see it's calling the log function again. Uh, wait, if I click there, it's showing oh the event. I'm sorry. So I have it showing the event on click. Um, so that is I think that's it for this example. The next one I want to show is, um, oh, using it with React. Oh. So what I've done here is create um, another um, project based off the Elixir script boilerplate where I have, I'm using macros that define React um, elements. And I'm doing that within this piece of code here, this module here. And here's another um, module attribute that Elixir script looks for, which is load only. So this is useful when there is something you want to do like at compile time, but um, Elixir script can't necessarily support like some of the things. Like for instance, an external reference, an, ex an external resource, and then creating creating the um, the, tag, the tags here. And basically, it, it can't support these things just yet. So it's a way of loading it in to use the macros, but it doesn't actually compile it to JavaScript. You can see we have a using statement here where we're actually importing in React and React DOM, um, and then we're importing in the macros that are created here. Now, some of this code might actually look sim somewhat familiar if anybody's read the, the metaprogramming Elixir um, book by, by um, Chris McCord. That's kind of where I got the, well, that's definitely where I got the example from. <laughs> this. And so here, 
we, we are, we're calling this using here, so we're using React for UI, and I'll just get to this point real quick. So here is our view, and you can see we have a div, which is actually creating the, the div element within React. We have our do block, and in here we can call um, with my form, which is a function that creates a form with inputs, so we can actually create view functions. Um, and here we have a field, which is also a function that creates a div. Um, and what I try to do here is kind of model the, the model view update that Elm is, um, is known for. So we have our initial state of a name and email, which are blank. The view, which I just showed before, is it's just a div with, I can actually show it. Um, yeah. It's just a div with some inputs, and I can type in this, and it'll just um, copy what's been written into here. And so the view takes in the model, and the model has, I mean, the view has um, event handlers, which we're calling here, we're calling update, which takes in the event, which is the first argument, and then um, basically the message are the, the attribute we want to change. And with an update, we're using an agent to, um, I, should, I should go back to the beginning, but we're using an agent here, and we're, we're getting that, and then we're updating the state of the agent based on the message. And to get back to the beginning, here we're using agent to start and giving it the initial state, and we're giving it, we're using the name, uh, I guess the alias of the model for it. And then we're calling render right away. And then we're going through, and for each render, it gets the model from the agent, it pipes that to the view, which then pipes that to React DOM dot render so that the, the view is updated. And that's pretty much it for that example. The next one I'll show is using it within um, a Phoenix project. So let's see. Oops, too much NPO. So I'll go to the mix file first. As you can see here, we have Elixir script as our dependency. We have added it to our compilers. We have our um, Elixir script configuration right here. So we're looking in uh, web static ex, ex js and then lib shared, and then it's outputting to web static js build. So we're kind of hijacking the uh, the, the branch pipeline a little bit so that whenever we update our Elixir script code, it goes into a place where branch can see it so that it can finish off the rest of it. Um, and, but I, we do have a, and I didn't talk about this, but we do have a, a, a Elixir script that has a watch command, so we're adding this here to our watchers. So it's this mix Elixir script dot watch. Our main Elixir script code is in here we're using that React UI thing I showed before again. Um, this is our main, which is using that React UI to build up the, the, the to-do app. So this is the, the to-do MVC, there it is, application that you might have seen before. We have our, our um, a data module here, we don't know, to do that data, which We'll go and call the, the Phoenix API using window.fetch and doing certain things. And most of what's happening, uh, actually, the updating is handled by list, which will get the list of, um, of to-dos from, from Phoenix and then um, add those and then call main to update, which actually goes and update, updates the view. Uh, yeah. 
So to do that model start to do is actually here in lib shared, which is just a struct, the title completed an ID. And we don't have, we're, we're not using Ecto here or any database, we're using um, an agent basically to store the state. And you can see we're also using to do that model start to do here. And this is on the server side. So it's using the same struct on both sides. And I can show off the to-do controller, but it's not really much here. And so we have our uh, to-do MVC app, so I don't know. Uh, speak at Lone Star Elixir. Uh, show of demos. Roadmap, oops, why do I always misspell that? And, oh, questions. And so this talk is pretty much almost over, so we can cross that out. Um, and it's just getting the state back from the agent on the side, so you can refresh it and it's, as long as you don't restart it, it'll just stay there. Uh, that was the last demo, so we can cross that off. And we can go back to the slides. I don't know how to, oh well. So on the roadmap, uh, get production ready. I think a lot of people, some people have asked me like, is it production ready? And my answer is always, if somebody's using it in production right now, I'm gonna have a heart attack. <laughs> uh, more documentation um, and better usability, which are definitely important to me. Dependency resolution, I think just the, this those three right there, more documentation, better usability, and dependency resolution will, will take things to a, to a, um, a higher level. And add more to standard library, obviously. Source maps, um, those are hard. So, yeah, those are hard. <laughs> Private macros, stable processes, and the rest of them have question marks, because I don't know. So, single file output. I do like the way that Elm just like, creates like just a single file. And I've been back, I went back and forth on that. Um, and there are a couple of other tasks that would need to be um, taken care of before that would be something that we could do. Um, but it's, it's still on the table. Uh, reader conditional, so I, I don't know if anybody, is anybody here familiar with uh, Clojure and ClojureScript? Um, all right, so um, one of the features that landed in Clojure maybe a couple of years ago was our reader conditionals, I think it's called, where depending on, um, Depending on what environment you're in, you can run certain co you can run different code. Um, that'd be kind of cool if you can do that in the, with the with the Elixir, Elixir script. Uh, WebAssembly. So this project WebAssembly might be out of the scope of this project, but it'd be cool if somebody, like, basically, made it so that um, Erlang and, and OTP can compile to WebAssembly, so that this project is obsolete. That'd be nice. Uh, OTP. Um, We'll see what happens with that. And compile from Beam. So I started another project a week ago um, just in a, as an experiment to, to get the, the, Erlang, the Erlang abstract format from Beam and then compile that to JavaScript. And that might be, uh, it's still an experiment, but it might be a, a, a better way to handle things because basically things like private macros and um, OTP as far as I can, as far as I know, um, those kind of issues would just go away, and then everybody in the Beam community could convert their code to JavaScript. Um, questions? Skip around 